Should we get started? We're live? Okay. Um, well, welcome. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for coming to today's session, the people online uh, and the people present. Uh, we're really pleased to have two representatives from NSERC today, uh, Philip Bale and Ronnie Sharp. Philip's a program officer at the physics with the Physics Evaluation Group, and Ronnie is a team leader at the, uh, with Environmental Sciences. Uh, today they'll talk about 2018 DG results, some useful tips moving forward, and an overview of NSERC programs. And of course, there's always a chance to ask questions at the end. Um, we have people online, so we can do, we can do it that way too. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, and over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much, David. And I think we can probably take questions as we I go along too. Yeah, I yeah. Think we, have a, we have a good sized group here. If you have any questions as, as we go through the slides, please don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, so thank you, David, for the introduction. Uh, so as he said, uh, thanks for joining the session. Um, my name is Philip Bale. I'm the program officer for the Physics Evaluation Group uh, within the Discovery Grants program. Uh, with me is Ronnie Sharp. She's the team lead with the Environmental Sciences. Uh, so today we're going to go through a couple of things about how to prepare a Discovery Grant application, kind of the process of uh, you know how the reviewers look at an application, um, some tips about preparing the application. We'll go into uh, some NSERC updates uh, regarding the programs. Um, I'll also discuss some of the competition results uh, for the Discovery Grants competition this year. Uh, and then we'll talk about NSERC updates and then some Discovery Grants updates as well. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions as they come along. I think uh, that's really the purpose of this session is to have one-on-one -on -one time with NSERC and to be able to ask those questions uh, as they come to you. <clears throat> so to get right into it, uh, first part is just how to prepare a discovery grant application. And uh, I guess a good place to start is just the kind of the life cycle of the DG application. So, uh, you know, it starts in August where uh, the submission of the notice of notification of intent to apply is due for August 1st. Uh, NSERC staff will start preparing internal assignments to the evaluation groups in September. Uh, in October, we're looking to select external reviewers and discuss uh, internally, uh, both with NSERC staff and uh, with section chairs and group chairs of the evaluation group uh, for potential joint reviews, uh, which I'll get into a bit later. Uh, November, the submission of the full application is due uh, in November 1st. By December, we prepare, the, uh, we prepare the application packages to give to the reviewers uh, and give it over to them to begin reviewing. Uh, through to January, they, uh, they prepare their reviews, uh, receive any external reviewer reports that uh, we've contacted out for and received. Uh, February is our competition weeks when the reviewers will uh, come to Ottawa and it's a face-to-face -face, uh, face -face review, conference model review. Uh, and then moving into April where we announce the results. So just the general life cycle of the DG application. Uh, so to get into the notif notification of intent to apply, like I said, the deadline is August 1st. Uh, some of the main components and what we're looking for uh, within that NOI is uh, you'll provide your research topics, so where you believe your research is best situated within the evaluation groups, um, your title, keywords, uh, a summary of the proposal, and then um, along with your CCV, a suggestions of external reviewers. Um, that will be submitted to the research portal. So nothing, uh, nothing too big there. Uh, and really, the, so the purpose of this NOI uh, stage is to really facilitate that preliminary assignment to the evaluation group members, uh, both for internal reviews and then using the external reviewer suggestions for external reviews as well. And really, that's the first stage where it's the first indication of where um, either uh, applications that cross, uh, cross different subject matter boundaries uh, between evaluation groups, we may indicate a joint review uh, using the research topics, the keywords, and the proposal summary for that. Um, and this is also what the evaluation uh, group members use. They'll, they'll have a look at that summary, the research topics, and the keywords to determine their capacity to review uh, so that we can see what kind of expertise we have to review those applications. Um, so a useful tip there, and I think it'll be reiterated later, but try and use specific keywords uh, specific to your research. Uh, it doesn't really help to apply vague terms uh, because they could be interpreted between, uh, between different uh, research expertise areas. Uh, and this is also, the NOI stage is also the first review of applications that may have subject matter eligibility between uh, both the tri or between CIHR uh, and SHRC. Um, social sciences and health research. 
Can I jump in with a quick question? Sure, yes. Just on that note, uh, are, there, are there any of you who are thinking of applying this year whose research kind of uh, touches on social sciences and humanities or CIHR health research type things? Yeah, so maybe just a little bit of information on the process in terms of how we do this at the NOI stage. If <coughs> we receive your NOI, we notice that there are elements of your application that tend a little bit more towards CIHR or SHRC type things uh, to the point where we have some concerns. We'll send you a letter to say we're concerned about this area being potentially not fully within NSERC's mandate and that's the kind of thing that you can use to help you develop your application a little bit more but it never hurts to call your program officer. If you have uh, questions. And a little later on in the, in the presentation you'll see a couple of reference documents that you may want to consult when you're preparing your NOI and when you're preparing your application to make sure you really frame it in the natural sciences and engineering context. Mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, no, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, that's great. No, no, second. well, yeah. Uh, uh, either well, way, I, feel free. I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> I'll sit down and I'll talk about it. So just a brief overview of the evaluation groups that, uh, that the Discovery Grants program operates within. Um, you may see your research fall within uh, one of these 12 groups. Uh, and then this is also, uh, there's a program officer for each evaluation group uh, to, uh, for internal discussion when we're discussing potential joint reviews between applications. Uh, so again, just uh, I think I already said this earlier, but uh, some tips during the NOI stage is to select appropriate research topics. If, you're, if your research really does uh, cross boundaries between evaluation groups, be sure to identify that because that helps us uh, best identify the assignments and expertise uh, to review the application. Um, it also helps identify potential joint reviews. And then um, the, again, a detailed summary. Uh, it all just kind of helps us, helps inform us to best uh, assign and review your application. Uh, yeah. uh, in addition, so when you are submitting your NOI, you'll be uh, suggesting external reviewers. Uh, so just some notes to be mindful of conflict of interest. These are uh, reviewers um, primarily. At, reviewers within your institution may be in conflict or within the department will be in conflict. Um, we have a link to the answer guidelines, uh, some examples of conflict of interest of, you know, within a six year window, if you've worked or published with someone, then that would, that would be a conflict of interest as well. Um, so try not to suggest those reviewers because we won't be able to use them. Uh, identify them with the best expertise and then uh, when you're, uh, when you're suggesting external reviewers, we do ask. It's a nice thing to consider the diversity in your selection. So try and go uh, within Canada, outside Canada, uh, between the private sector, government sector, and then uh, you know underrepresented groups and all career stages. Uh, it's just to is is to have a, a diverse selection so that you have people from all walks of life, like uh, kind of, yeah, yeah, I, s certainly uh, expertise is a primary factor that people can speak to that, but if you can, uh, you know, NSERC's always working to uh, have better uh, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion among the review process, so, uh, you know, we're looking to you for that selection, uh, for those selections as well. Um, but yeah, ex it is a good point, expertise is uh, what we're looking for. Yeah. But I could, or I could be trying to find other people who I don't know as well who I and recommend them. Why? What? What's going to help me specifically for my success in my grant application? I, I guess is it, it is. Going to be going to influence what, what my name is going to influence in my grant application, or is just people going into the pool who will be chosen for years and years for all these grant applications? Yeah. So the when you're suggesting external reviewers, it's just for that competition cycle for the people that we're contacting. So uh, in terms of what may provide you the best success, uh, it, it would be someone that could speak, you know, expertise wise to, uh, to that application. Um, yeah, just. Yeah, I think the idea is just that um, 
for example, we you're going to suggest up to five people, and we are going to ask the committee members to select then a number of people, which will be drawn from your suggestions and any other ideas that they may have. So, if in preparing your list you can consider presenting kind of a diverse group of people for them to draw on, that that can be very helpful. But it's not they're not limited to those people, and they are considered just for that competition and this application that you're submitting because. <coughs> You'll have your summary of your research proposal and the CCD that you're going to present. They're going to use that to figure out what expertise they need and who they should avoid in terms of conflict of interest based on your publication lists and your, your, your uh, co-authors. So uh, it's just one more piece to help inform the selection that will happen. Yeah. At least you would not to narrow yourself too much to the way or Yeah, and keep in mind too that we have the uh, the uh, the approach that we take with external reviewers is we typically don't send more than three applications in a single competition to one person. So if you know, you may not be the only person suggesting. The same person. Yeah. Not all ten applicants are going to have their application sent to that person. That's part of the reason we're asking for a diverse group of suggestions because it does kind of open up our options in terms of who may be appropriate when, when they're making these selections. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rani. <clears throat> okay, so that was the notification of intent to apply stage. Uh, moving forward to the full application stage, we have a November 1st deadline um, within your university or uh, you may have uh, earlier internal deadlines to be aware of, but in terms of when to submit to NSERC, that's uh, November 1st. Uh, the main components of the full application are, of course, the application for the grant, uh, the research proposal, uh, your samples of research contribution, uh, a budget and justification section, and then uh, the CCV as well. Uh, and this, again, will be submitted through the research portal. <clears throat> So in terms of the review process for the full application, uh, the reviewers are looking, it's a merit assessment based uh, process. There's three equally weighted criteria. You have the excellence of the researcher, uh, the merit of the proposal, and then the contribution to training of highly qualified personnel, or HQP as I'll probably be referring to it from now on. Uh, it uses a six point scale. Uh, it ranges from exceptional on the high end to insufficient on the low end. Um, and I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, but uh, this is the merit indicator grid that we provide to all of the reviewers. Uh, it is available online and in our peer review manual. Uh, so, you know, when you're preparing that application, I would highly recommend going through the peer review manual and looking at this because this is what the reviewers uh, will look at when they're, when they're reviewing applications. In terms of the nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, once the reviewers come to Ottawa to perform their reviews, uh, We'll have them seated in a room. Uh, the program officer and a section chair will be uh, kind of leading, leading the discussion of each uh, application. Uh, so the program officer will ask if there's any conflicts in the room. Uh, identified some conflicts with the red exclamation points. So conflicts will leave the room. Uh, people in conflict with the application will, read the, will leave the room. Uh, any non-readers don't have to leave the room if they're not in conflict, but they won't be participating in the discussion. It's just the five people assigned to each application. Uh, so across, uh, you know, around the table, you have your first internal, uh, second internal, and then three readers. <clears throat> Uh, so in, in that order, they'll all present their uh, ratings for the application uh, and then their review of the application, uh, taking into account the three merit criteria, along with uh, you know, the external reviewer reports are considered and uh, among a, a litany of other things. Uh, so after all five people have spoken, the uh, section chair or uh, the chair that's leading uh, the discussion of the application will ensure that all three criteria have been spoken on. Uh, and if they see any discrepancies or large discrepancies between the merit criteria, uh, their job isn't to ensure uh, consensus, it's just to ensure that if there are discrepancies between the review that they're discussed and that the, the five uh, reviewers have a good sense of where everyone is coming from before voting. Uh, so then the, once the application has been fully discussed, the reviewers will vote on the application uh, and the next slide will show kind of the, how the outcome is achieved. 
so if you have five reviewers voting on each of their merit rating criteria, uh, you'll see the, the outcome was outstanding, very strong, very strong, and it's the median result. Median? The median result. Yeah, when there are five votes, the one in the middle. Yeah, the one in the middle gets taken. So as you can see, uh, even though you have a range from exceptional to very strong, outstanding will be the result for excellence of the researcher, uh, very strong for merit of the proposal, and then very strong for contribution to the HQP. Uh, so in conjunction with that, once the, once the merit ratings uh, have been assigned, then applications with, like, with uh, like merit ratings will get put into a funding bin and then money allocated to that bin, uh, money is allocated to that bin for uh, successful researchers. Okay, I'm going to just jump in for a second sure. and I'm going to come up closer to you because I hear that you have the, right, the microphone that uh, people can hear. So um, just one thing to mention is that uh, in addition to everything Phil has said is that that discussion with the five members voting on your application, it happens in 15 minutes. It's very quick. We're on a really tight schedule. So it's something to keep in mind when you are preparing your application in the sense that you're going to have a range of of people with varying expertise looking at your application. Some of them may be very close, some of them may not be so close, and in that sense, presenting your proposal in a way that is accessible to non-experts can be very helpful uh, because it does give them sort of the information they need to be able to have that conversation in the short time frame that's available. Just to give you a bit of a sort of a sense of the way it's distributed in, in my committees, in my team, which are the Evolution and Ecology and Geosciences Committees, we have about 25 members reviewing a total of 200 applications. So on any given application, only one-fifth of the committee is actually reading it. So that just, if you look at the membership lists online, which are available to you, um, it, it just gives you a sense of the range of the expertise of the people who are going to be looking at your application, and it's something to keep in mind when you're preparing. Sure. Thanks. Do you have an evaluation in members, evaluation group committee members? Are they looking at the application and evaluating the members now, or are those still being... In progress. Yeah, still in progress. Yeah. That's so are they updated kind of dynamically as you get people to fill That's up? right. Yeah. And, yeah, and so if you look at what's posted online right now, it's probably still last year's membership because it won't be updated until the next one is approved, but the, I believe the retirement dates are listed, so you can tell who's, who's, who's coming, coming off out, and yeah. who's coming on, yeah. or not who's coming on, but who's going to be replaced. Yeah. So you can, and you can call the program officer if you want to, you know, get a sense of things. Or if you want to volunteer to be on a committee, you can yes, also call the yeah. program feel officer. Free, feel free to contact <laughs> us. We're always looking for, uh, for willing members. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, Digressed a little bit. Is but. there a time when you said 15 minutes? Is, it a, is there a timer going? Yes. yes and and a... part of the reason for that is the reason we call it the conference model is because we we take over the entire building basically during competition, and every meeting room in the in the building is hosting a series of applications, and the members are literally moving between the rooms, and so we have to. It's quite a complex scheduling exercise, as Phil will attest. Sometimes running between and, rooms. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so it's it's logistically quite complex, so we really do have to stick to our schedule. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. A, I'd say just going through it for one time, it's a, it's a hard 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Once that 15 minutes is up, you gotta move on to the next one yeah. or you'll fall, uh, you'll fall behind. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, Okay, so uh, moving into the merit criteria. Uh, the first one is the excellence of the researcher. Uh, so this assessment's really based on uh, achievements demonstrated over the past six years. Uh, reviewers will be looking at kind of the knowledge, expertise, and experience of the researcher in the natural sciences and engineering. Um, some possible evidence of this of the stature in this field will include, you know, grants, awards, or prizes that are received, uh, invitations to to give lectures or write review articles, um, other memberships on committees or editorial boards, um, involvement in public outreach activities, um, and then other applicable recognition factors. You know, it kind of differs within each field. Uh, there's also the quality and impact of contributions to the NSC uh, to NSC research. Uh, this also includes publications, conference presentations, uh, books, 
patents, technical reports, uh, kind of a whole host of anything that you can show how how you've impacted uh, or contributed to natural science research. Uh, and then the last one would be importance of contributions to researchers and other end users. <clears throat> uh, and then, so this is kind of more, it's the extent to which an applicant's work has advanced the field, um, you know, creating significant change in thought within the research area, uh, and then also the extent of contributions to the development of, you know, standards or core practices. Um, within the past six years, I think is the key, is the key there. So, uh, you know, at the time of application, I think for this one, the six years would be 2013? No, 20... It's at the time of application, so 2012. 2012, yeah. yes. Uh, so what will members use to assess this information? So they're gonna be looking at, uh, within the application, there's a section for most significant contributions that should highlight the quality and impact. Uh, there's also a section for samples of research contributions that you can attach uh, up to four with your application. Uh, just something to note that these uh, samples should be within the last six years. Um, so, and a kind of a differentiation between the most significant contributions and the samples of research contributions is that the most significant contributions can include uh, uh, things that may, uh, the things that are outside of the six year window but may still, that may have an impact today. Uh, and if that is the case, we'll be looking to researchers to present and just to, you know, justify why that impact is being felt today. Uh, for the samples of research contributions, we're really looking uh, for those four attachments to be within the last six years. Uh, yes? So I have a question about the significant contributions because it comes up a lot. Is it required that the most significant contribution be like an article or some publication? I, I've often argued that with my researchers that it can be a description of a thematic area and, and to outline that as a contribution. Is that allowable? I, I, I believe yes. so, yeah, and I yes, think in, in any case it will, you know, it will always be on the applicant to, if they do choose to include something like that, to really show, to show that impact and to show uh, why it is a significant contribution. But yeah, there's no uh, steadfast uh, and, and way to present it. Yeah. Years, as long as, it shows as, long as you show the impact is being felt today, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then, yeah, that'll be on the applicant or the researcher to to properly show in the application. Yeah, certainly that's one of the features from our previous application system that we wanted to carry over into this new one in the portal. We wanted to leave room for people to be able to make a case that they've had a contribution, you know, of a certain type, and it could refer to a series of publications, for example, and other, other types of contributions, uh, outreach activities. There's all kinds of things that people have sort of use that space to creatively present themselves as, as excellent in whatever way they would like, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, the first merit rating criteria, the uh, excellence of the researcher. Uh, the next one would be the merit of the proposal. Uh, so this assessment is based on uh, the originality and innovation of uh, the proposed program, uh, significance and expected contributions to the research, uh, clarity, scope of objectives, appropriateness of the methodology, uh, the feasibility of the, both the program and the research, uh, appropriateness and justification for the budget, and then uh, justification or if you have a relationship to other research support uh, both within the tri-councils and outside just to present that and say you know I've got this other funding uh, the, or this other research support. Uh, so yeah, and uh, to kind of follow up on the research support, uh, we're looking at if it's outside of CIHR or SHRC, uh, the budget requested in the Discovery Grants program should be for different expenses than the ones that are supported or to be supported by uh, the other uh, the other sources. If the other research support is within uh, is uh, held by CIHR or SHRC, uh, we're looking for the program to be distinct conceptually from the research supported or to be supported by CIHR or SHRC. Um, and then new to this past competition, yeah? Can you just clarify what it means to be distinct conceptually? So for instance, I've had essays written by Dr. Sharp and Dr. simultaneously before for um, closely related projects. And 
under those terms, I said, I, I, I clarified that the answer from G was for fundamental research and theory and understanding. And my work on the shirt was largely application based, almost like a consultant to the other members of the group. I don't know if the rules have changed since then, or if that's the only way to be distinct conceptually. I think that sounded. Um, so the, the question for those of you who are online is about the how do you describe the conceptual distinctness between what you're proposing for your NSERC DG versus project funding from another uh, agency. And I think the approach that you describe is good in the sense that uh, the Discovery Grant program, one of the things that makes it unique among the agencies, with the possible exception of the foundation grants that have been introduced at CIHR, is that it is a, a flexible program of research that you're undertaking and you've got your long-term and sort of medium-term and short-term objectives, but that can, you can adapt as you go, right? But your long-term objectives probably aren't going to change that much. It might just be the way you get there, whereas the project that you're applying for through SHRC or CIHR will have much more clear and specific objectives, uh, in a sense. And um, the thing with SHRC and CIHR and NSERC is that as the tri-agencies, we're legally mandated to fund different things, right? And so for those, those of you who are kind of in the gray zone between the agencies, it's important to articulate uh, what part is natural sciences and engineering and what part is either social sciences and humanities or CHR. And if you can get a good handle on that, you can often address this distinct conceptually question that way as well. Is that, is that helpful? Does that answer your question? OK, thank you. Uh, and then so Ronnie had also mentioned the foundation grant so new to the competition uh, last year for any um, CIHR Foundation grant holders or applicants. Um, we were requesting convincing evidence that support from the Discovery Grants program is essential to carry out the work proposed. And I think the, um, the key there is because the Foundation grant uh, at CIHR also supports a program of research, Discovery Grant supports a program of research, we want to see the difference because, as Ronnie said, you know, the tri-councils have different mandates on what kind of research uh, we should be funding. Uh, so in terms of where the members are looking for this information, uh, you know, they'll, they'll look to the research proposal, uh, the list of references, both with some page limits, uh, the proposed expenditures and budget justification, and then again, uh, there'll be a section to address any relationship to other research support, uh, both within the application and uh, the CCV. And you can just include your entire budget page from your CIHR or CERF grant as part of that attach them. I don't recommend attaching an entire uh, proposal, which I have seen. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't tend to get read and it can be a little bit irritating for the committee because they are already reading enough stuff related to your application, but certainly include the budget pages because that can be very helpful and, uh, and help them see how it's distinct. Uh, so Ronnie had touched on it a bit earlier, but for those applicants that are, you know, uh, crossing between or with uh, research that kind of crosses between the tri-agencies. Uh, so NSERC supports research uh, whose major challenges lie in the natural sciences and engineering. Uh, and then the key there is other than the health sciences. Um, so the intended objectives of the research must primarily be to advance knowledge in one or more of the natural science or engineering disciplines. Um, the links provided there uh, are really just kind of, they're useful to applicants if they have any questions or are curious whether they're, uh, or are concerned whether their uh, research falls between uh, natural sciences engineering, uh, health research, or social sciences. So the selecting the appropriate uh, federal granting agency, um, and then we continue to update it, but the addendum to the guidelines for eligibility of applications related to health. Uh, uh, especially the addendum, it kind of gives uh, examples that illustrate uh, what applications may or may not be uh, uh, eligible as they're related to human health or natural sciences and engineering. Uh, so the first review of subject matter el eligibility, as Ronnie had pointed out, uh, is done by NSERC at the notice of, uh, notification of intent to apply stage. Uh, 
if we do find that there is kind of a, a blurred line between the research, applicants are notified and given the opportunity to provide that justification at the full application stage. Uh, it is kind of key to note that decisions can be made at any, at any stage of the process, but we obviously try and address it as early as possible uh, to provide applicants that opportunity to, to uh, come back to us with why their uh, research falls within natural sciences and engineering. And really the best advice we can give on this if you are one of those people that is going to need to check this and think about it in terms of your application is to contact us early. The sooner you have that conversation, the more quickly it can be resolved and we can give you the kind of feedback or input that you might need to help you uh, put your application together as effectively as possible and of course work with your research grants offices and any support that might be available to you internally. Uh, so that was the merit of the proposal, the second merit rating criteria. The last one is contributions to the training of HQP. Uh, and then this, so this merit rating criteria is broken up into two parts. Uh, it's based both on the past contributions to training and the future plans for training. Uh, what we're looking at is, you know, quality research training at all levels are valued. And as you can see, it runs from undergraduate to, you know, other research personnel for non-academic sectors. Um, in terms of the review of the application, uh, it is, uh, so all three, all three of the merit rating criteria are assessed equally between uh, early career researchers and uh, established researchers. For the contributions to the training of HQP, uh, early, career, early career researchers, it's understood, may not have that uh, history of past contributions to training if they've followed that linear path. Uh, there are some examples of people coming from industry or internationally uh, coming to Canada who may have that history. But by and large, early career researchers won't necessarily have that contributions to training. Um, so when members are looking at uh, early career researchers, uh, and it's included in our uh, message to applicants for anybody who has applied, um, a rating of moderate for early career researchers is perfectly normal. Um, and it's to, uh, it's to help them uh, improve for later applications, but also uh, early career researchers are rated a bin lower. They're funded a bin lower. Funded a bin lower um, to help them with their career stage and uh, yeah, so this is in terms of excellence of the researcher, merit of the proposal. Uh, early career researchers, established researchers are rated the same. Uh, and then HQP, it's really just focusing on that past, past contributions. But we do look for you know, a good future plans for training uh, to show us that you're, uh, you're working on it. Uh, so the question is, do we consider HQP who are not NSERC funded? Um, I would, yeah. Go, do you want to try yeah, so I would say for, for the past contributions, uh, the outcomes of the HQP doesn't necessarily need to fall in the natural sciences and engineering um, because we understand, you know, people may not, after receiving the training, they may not uh, continue in that field. Uh, so for past contributions, it can, it can be outside of natural sciences. For the future plans, we are really looking to zone in and have it be within the natural sciences and engineering. So I don't know if that... Well, so I used to be funded by NSERC, and they were doing things like that cost for a while. I want to go back to NSERC with all my HDP, I felt like that was the last six years, and that's why I got the funding. So I'm going to go into HDP that had NSERC, and so do I consider those uh, students in postdoc, or do I include zero HDP? You should report them. Yeah. Anybody that you've trained, you can report. I mean, when you when you describe that in your application, you will you know if you have their consent, you'll list their names and the and the years supervised and the title of their project, and it might be clear that those were more health related. But the fact that you were training those people, and then Phil will talk a little bit more about how you can sort of describe your training environment. You can you can get into that a little bit more in the free form sections related to this. Uh, If, so the two types, I guess, is there's primary supervision and then co-supervision in terms of... Yeah, just repeat the question. As oh, sorry. a PDF, if you were supervising uh, people, how do you report them on the application? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And so I think uh, in, in terms of the, what you can list, so there is the primary supervision, co-supervision. Um, and so I'm actually, I think. If, you, if your appointment as a PDF officially allowed you to co-supervise or supervise, you could list them that way. Uh, again, though, there is another section, and th that's what you should include in the structured list in the application. But there is a free form section on HPP that you can use to describe any past contributions as well uh, that might not fall under the category of official supervision, but that you'd like to highlight, particularly as an early career researcher. It's an opportunity for you to give some of that information to the reviewers. And I think if we I probably go to the next slide, there's going to be more information. Is that? Uh, yeah, so this yeah. is just for past contributions to training of HQP. That assessment's based on the past six years. Uh, and so the past contribution section will include three components, both uh, the training environment, uh, any awards or research contributions that the HQP have received, and then any outcomes or skills gained, uh, gained by the HQP. Um, and then so outcomes and skills are really any skill sets uh, any skill sets that they may have developed, uh, outcomes is you know where they go after if they're doing further studies or if they receive jobs or stayed in stayed in the field that you were training them in. Uh, so for this one, as I had said, the impact can be outside of the NSC, but it should be clear that the skills gained in the research training are being used by the HQP to show that you know that the training was the training was held. It doesn't necessarily need to uh, have impact within natural sciences. Uh, that information can be found both within the CCV uh, in terms of supervisory activities, publications, uh, and publications. So where the HQP may have published uh, with, or may have published as co-authors, we do ask that you identify them with an asterisk in the CCV, or in the, yeah, in the CCV. Uh, and then in the application, you can also include information about this. Uh, there's an HQP section, uh, and then uh, you can include any conference presentations or uh, other information not presented in the CCV that you'd like to highlight. And I would say just picking up again on this question of what qualifies as formal or whatever type of supervision, I would say for the for the person who's early in their career who did some supervision, not in a in a in an eligible academic appointment, uh, you could still mark publications that you had produced where you were supervising the work of the person and in the CCV and then in the free form section, because the committee of course looks at the whole package, you could, you could talk about that to say, this was my role in the supervision, I was in this position and technically we had the same supervisor but I was responsible for the day to day supervision and formulating the questions and whatever it was that you did, you can talk about that uh, to give the, the committee what they need, the reviewers what they need to really understand. Yeah, the context what that behind that supervision was. Yeah. Another question? Yes. When you say list HQP awards, you mean the awards that the people on training received? Yeah, so the, so the question is to list HQP awards or the, or the awards that they received because of the training that they received? So SRA or a ETS scholarship, that's what you mean? Uh, I yeah, or it could so, be yeah. a Worcester Prize or something if any, they received some kind of award. Anything that someone you train yeah. was recognized for yes. related to the work. Yes. Put it in here. Is this all free form? This uh, within the CCV, it is not. Do the HQP awards go in the CCV? Oh, no, they, they, they go in the app. Form. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they are section. data application. Yeah. So you have room to do that in the free form. The CCV, of course, is much more structured yeah. <laughs> than the free form section, so you're quite limited in terms of the way you list things on the CCV. And that's part of the reason we added that free form section in, was to give people a chance to sort of write a narrative about their. HQP contributions because the committee finds that extremely helpful in their assessment. Uh, so continuing on to the section for past contributions to training of HQP, some other items to consider, uh, and I guess this has been elaborated on, is providing the context, so explaining the level, context, role of supervision or co-supervision. Um, if the HQP incurred any, uh, or yeah, if the HQP incurred any delays in training uh, or the applicant had any delays in training, how that may have affected the contributions to training of HQP. Um, and so we're really looking to focus on that quality and impact of the training. Um, 
as it relates to past contributions. Uh, and then, as I had mentioned earlier, so members are instructed uh, for early career researchers not to rate them as insufficient in, in this area, uh, or not to rate them insufficient only because of a limited past record of contributions to the HQP. So there is the other section for future plans as well. Uh, and just, just that last bullet focus on quality and impact of training. Um, we've been getting better over the years, I think, at, at making sure that committees really, the, the assessment of quality and impact of training is not always directly related to the level at which the training is happening. So if you're at a primarily undergraduate university, you are as able to make a strong case for the quality and impact of your training based on the type of, of supervision that you're doing in your lab as at a, at a more, uh, at a bigger institution. So it has been a challenge over the years and we recognize that in terms of, of how HQP contributions are assessed. But you'll notice um, if, you've, if you've been following our peer review literature for many years that it has evolved quite a bit. Uh, particularly in recent years, and particularly as we have an increasing focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion as well. So yeah. there, there's a lot of guidance included in the instructions around this kind of thing, as well as in the peer review manual, which is quite long, but elaborates considerably on all of these elements that we're talking about today. So you can certainly look at it. It's posted on our website. Yeah, it's a, it's a long but very valuable resource to, really ch to check out. Yeah. yeah, I think it's chapter. <laughs> for HQP. It is more procedural. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of highlights the past contributions to training HQP. Uh, so new to our new instructions were provided in uh, last year's competition for a future pl future plans for training, uh, and then within this, it includes two components. You've got your training philosophy, so really, um, you know where you're coming from, what you believe training should, uh, you know how you believe you should be training HQP, what you'd like to see them come out of it with. Uh, it doesn't need to be, you know, a day-to-day -day plan of, you know, I, I plan on having, you know, two-hour sessions every day, but just kind of a philosophy of, uh, you know, how you would like to instruct your HQP and build, and build their training, uh, their skill sets. Uh, and then it also includes a research training plan. Uh, so some tips here is to focus on the quality, the suitability, and the clarity of the plan. Um, Different from the past contributions, future plans for training uh, must be planned training in the natural sciences and engineering. Uh, and then, you know, similar to past contributions, please define your role if there's any planned co-supervision um, and within the, uh, so you can list that within the application and then within the CCV it provides you uh, an opportunity to, to uh, define your role there. Uh, and then, uh, you know, encourage any approaches that promote increased inclusion and advancement of women. So again, NSERC's really pushing for this equity, diversity, and, inc and inclusion. So uh, committee members do see it as a as a net positive, and it's a it's a component of excellence of the research training plan. If you're if they see an effort uh, to promote that increased inclusion and uh, diversity for you know women, underrepresented groups, uh, minorities as well. Trying to understand why the big underline in the uh, new rules of the plan for natural sciences and engineering. It seems to me that that's trying to stop people from training people in the health sciences, for example, even though their research discipline is uh, eligible. Okay. So I find this a bit strange uh, because if my, the research area is eligible, and you happen to be in a crossover area where you're training students on your eligible project, but they will end up in healthcare. That should not be discounted, and this is indicating it will be. Okay, so maybe I can just clarify a bit. The question is about the emphasis on the fact that the plan has to be related to training in the NSE. Uh, really, fundamentally, it's a question of, um, of how we're allowed to spend NSERC's money. Right, so it doesn't mean that that the trainee must, at the end of all their training, end up in a discipline that is within the natural sciences and engineering. It just means that the activities that they're going to be doing within that program of research are going to be 
related to the NSC elements of the person's overall program. Does that clarify? I mean, there are different ways of approaching this, but I have seen budgets where, you know, the discovery grant is paying half of the student stipend because they're working on project A, and then some CIHR funding is paying the other half because in the other half of the time they're working on project B, and that's okay as long as the money that you're requesting of NSERC is, is limited to that NSE component. Does that, does that help? Okay. There's another question. So, uh, for the training fund, uh, we try to come up with some pretty creative uh, innovative ways of, of training our uh, students and postdocs and so on. Um, so, do you, do you share any policy? Well, I, I, I'm part of the administrative support team for the Evolution <laughs> Ecology so, Panel, yes. So, okay. yeah. so do you have any comments then on you know, examples of specific training strategies that our panel members may want to help? So, so we've on only seen, this is the, we've only been through our first cycle of this particular uh, set of instructions of related to HQP. We did a we did a bit of a revamp last year because the committee was having a, the committees in general were having a lot of difficulty trying to figure out how to weigh the past versus the future as they were presented. Um, so just based on our experience of this year's competition, uh, I can say that there was a really there were a wide variety of plans that were presented in terms of describing the training environment. Um, some of them were more effective than others, and a lot of them were kind of, there was kind of a typical plan, if I can say, and then there were some that were more creative. Uh, we'd be reluctant to sort of put them out there because we don't want to tell people what to put in yeah. their plans, right? So it's a little bit of a balancing act in terms of seeing what applicants will present in terms of a strong plan. Uh, I can, um, you know, if, if you're speaking with members of the panel, and I know there's a member of that panel in this at Dalhousie, um, you might be able to get some more specific feedback. I know that at the discipline-specific Canadian Society for Evolution and Ecology, there's usually a mock review, and a lot of members and former members come and participate in that, so I think they're doing that in Guelph in July. I don't know if you're going to that meeting, but they also post them or in YouTube or something. They make them publicly available. We can chat more after if you'd like. Yeah. yeah. So, so again, it's kind of new because this is only the first year we've been going through it. But um, I, I also do you have I think to add yeah I think I think just in terms you know speaking generally as well. But it, if if you do feel that the training plan is original or it's innovative, um, and you and you have that excitement behind when you're writing it on the application, the members will the members will mm -hmm. see that. That they can they can see this this training plan may be different from the other ones proposed uh, you know in their cadre of applications, um, but it's really good to you know as best as you can identify that in the application and show that you have this uh, you know this different tr kind of training plan that you'd like to put through. Yeah. So it's a, it's a different question. Well, I, I, so what uh, like qualifies as a, as a training? Sounds kind of a bit bizarre. Uh, what's the concept? Uh, um, should we refer to uh, like a cunt uh, in, in, in our uh, in, in our this, this paragraph? Or, or yeah, it's I'm, I'm quite non person about the training should we call? And I, I so most most natural scientists are actually <laughs> maybe I do in short are rather averse to anything philosophical. Yeah, we are engineers, we are scientists, we don't do philosophy. It's like a fine side. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to think of any kind of like uh, examples per se of it, but really they're looking at um, what your overarching uh, thoughts are about training, how you'd like to approach that training. Um, I understand it, it, the philosophy aspect may be throwing it off, but just to say, yeah, I'm, I'm okay, trying. So, um, 
I, the question is about how does one articulate the training philosophy, and I think there are some more, we elaborate more on that in the instructions, so I don't have them on hand, but you can certainly take a look. I think, I think even before we introduced this language, we had applicants who were coming to us talking about sort of their pedagogical approach to how they teach their students and things like that. So, and, and I don't know which philosophers they may have quoted or education specialists, but in terms of the type of environment that you try to create in your, in your lab group, the types of skills you try to incorporate into your, you know, how you approach training in science or engineering with your, with your students and trainees. Um, we have seen some very interesting examples, examples yeah. and, and they're kind of case by case, like it's not a prescriptive thing. And, People can take all kinds of different approaches that will be quite interesting for the committee and they see the added value in the kind of training that you're going to be giving these students, not just in the discipline, but kind of extending beyond that. Yeah. Just a quick comment. I usually interpret it as principles, like training principles. Yeah. Um, basically what you said rather than philosophy. Right, rather than academic philosophy more like yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, but like over, right. over, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, is it in any way related to teaching philosophy? Like, you know, because there's a lot of uh, literature and sort of uh, examples of little teaching philosophy statements, so like things like motion and things like it that. Could be. So, some of that could be borrowed, or is it somewhat distinct? I think it could be. I, I think, you know, read the, read the way we kind of instruct that section. It is a free form section. You're trying to make a case to the reviewers that they should rate you highly on your training plan. Yeah. Just and just what just information do you want to give them to, oh, to get? Just to undergraduate to students. <coughs> yeah, and I can certainly see some components of a teaching plan being applicable to a training of HQP as well. I think it's... Yeah. And uh, a couple more questions, one at the back, yes. Yeah. I. I think that my students mostly come to me because of my research areas, uh -huh. the equipment or interesting other things that I have to offer beyond the research areas and my personality. I don't actively go out and say, this person's from an underrepresented group, this is someone I want to, I want to bring in. Uh, however, I do, well, I'm a member of the steering committee of Dow Allies, which is the LGBT plus um, the broad umbrella group on campus. Not There are two other groups which are more political. Um, and that's very obvious from signs on my door, things I say in class, and so on. So I'm, I'm open especially to underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. And um, but and that, I, I think that's some, that somewhat makes some students come to talk to me. And then they're interested in my work as well, and they, they want to join the, the team. Um, but I don't actively do so. Can I put, would, if I write that, is that likely to, to be seen positively? Or is it just sort of like, well, this, this applicant doesn't have a plan. They just have this vague other thing they do. It, you might not know. I, I, I can certainly see it being a, a positive anyways, it, in regardless of... I can't see it being negative, except that it could take space away from something else that could be saying. I mean, that, that is a bit of a plan. That can be incorporated into a larger plan, I would think. Yes, I, I would think so, because I think I can say students... I, I try to recruit students in my classes. I try to recruit students by going to seminars and asking questions, or going up to the speaker with, when there are students around. But mostly, they come because of what my research is. And my research isn't particularly involved with society. I'm in computer science and library science. I do a lot of information and information technology things, which aren't particularly tied to social classes, groupings, sexuality, anything. And I, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's, often the case with a lot of the natural sciences and engineering disciplines. Certainly when we look at our colleagues at CIHR, they, they've been doing this for a lot longer than us because they have to talk about the, the, the interrelation between the way they design 
their research projects, which involve humans, and whether those humans are are male or female has a an implication in terms of the results oh, of the research, which is which yeah, which is which is particular to that, and we see it in some of the natural sciences and engineering. But I do think that your point of of making sure that you convey an openness to potential HQP is is something you could incorporate into a plan, as David said. I think that would be that would be fine. And if if alongside that you could demonstrate that you have recruited a diverse group of trainees into your into your program over time, I think that would also be a strength. Yeah, yeah. whether or not it came directly out of that involvement right. in the in that umbrella uh, committee, it's just it still shows a willingness or an approach that you're promoting it. Uh, maybe not actively or as actively as you can, but just it, it does show it adds to a to that uh, overall know, component. Are you a member of that? Up over here. Right. <laughs> you know, and I don't yeah. have a little fencing ghetto. Right. Yeah. right. That's not. That's not the. No. no. I think Kirti had a question. Yes. Uh, this is from an online viewer. Uh, will you give us an overview of the 2018 Discovery Grants competition results? Could you also update us about the impact of federal budget 2018 on NSERP PG grants? That's coming. It's coming. Yeah. That's coming. Yeah. 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 It's coming. Thank you. So <laughs> for the reminder, the yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so any more questions about this? So I'll just uh, I'll move through for uh, looking through training of HQP. Uh, so the evaluation group will assess these HQP using both information from the application and the CCV. I think as we've described, uh, the application will have uh, the components of past contribution and HQP training plan that free form text for you to really justify or not justify, but to uh, promote and present what you've done and what you plan to do. Uh, and then within the CCV, you can list supervisory activities and contributions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, any trained HQP who have co-authored should be identified with an asterisk. Um, and then kind of specific language around not using an academic advisor, because it can be kind of a nebulous term. Uh, but we're looking for, I believe it's primary supervisor and co-supervisor. It might just be supervisor and co-supervisor. Or supervisor, co-supervisor. you have a drop-down menu that you Select your role with certain HQP. All we're saying here is please don't use academic advisor. I think some of the agencies and organizations that use the CCV have a certain meaning they attach to that, and we tend to just stick with the the other two options: yes. <laughs> supervisor and co-supervisor. Yes. If you are a committee member of this committee, for example, how you can how you can put the academic advisor or? Sorry, you know, I, I. If you're a, so, if you're an academic advisor for somebody's thesis, like on a thesis committee, you mean, or the? Yeah, because here we uh, we are committee member for thesis committee. For example, we are not directly supervisor or co supervisor, right. but we are in the committee. So, so yeah, you, you should not list yeah, those people as your HQP. Only people that you have directly supervised or co supervised should be listed. But if you have participated in the thesis committee of students, uh, I'm not sure if there's a place in the CCV for that or in the freeform section of the application. But if not the CCV, then you can put it in the freeform section. If you Just to highlight, yeah, highlight your participation on it. Yeah. But it, as, as such, it wouldn't directly relate to the direct training or a training of those HQP as, you, as you're sitting on the board or the, the panel. Um, in our program, uh, uh, PhD students have to do projects with uh, people other than their primary supervisor. So they have to do a full research project with two other people. Um, and so if you have supervised some students who have publications with them, do you consider them, are you a supervisor, a co-supervisor? Because you're not their primary PhD supervisor, but you are their primary supervisor on that project. Um, or that series of projects for which they're publishing with you. So you're not. You're also not a co-supervisor. Is there a term that you use, or do you have to explain it in the free form? I'd, I'd, I'd suggest explaining it, it to, to include it, explain it in the free form. Um, in terms of what to list it in the CCV, I guess that's a little. I. I they are a trainee. Yeah. They're yeah. A direct trainee of yours, but. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question because I know that in the publication list on the CCV, we do ask you to put that asterisk and 
and you may have published things with trainees who are no longer on your list because they're not in the six-year window, but the publication is within the six-year window and you can put a star beside it, and I know that's okay. It's okay to put a star beside someone who was your student who's no longer on your list if the publication's inside the window. As for whether you can put a star beside other students who you supervised but not in a formal capacity, I'm not sure. We can, we can but it, it is a formal. So if okay. Okay. If, yes. it is, if it is a formal, I think, yeah. I think that's the same as when you um, have an undergraduate student that works a summer work term for you. Or an honors thesis. Or an honors thesis. Well, honors thesis is different because you can select the degree, honors degree. Mm -hmm. you know, but for the ones where you're not picking the degree, I think you treat it just like a, a work term. I think you can include it in the same way. As a graduate student work term? Why not? I mean, it's, the, it's a formal supervision. If it doesn't say you can't, and it's within the window, I mean, if there's room to explain something along the lines of what you've described in the free form, then you can. But I think that sounds reasonable. Yeah, and follow. especially if it's considered a formal, like, if it's considered a yeah. formal supervision, I, I would suggest explaining it in the, you know, in the free form section just to give the committee members that information. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Wouldn't that be sort of co-supervision, I would think? Could, I don't know if it's but considered co-supervision in your context. You're not a supervisor of the student, right, the yeah. program, so, but you are supervising specific projects with students. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I can look into it more, too, if you want to uh, get in touch about it. Any other questions? Uh, so just some tips overall about uh, discovery grants up applications in terms of uh, you know seeing what may or may uh, may or may not pass as a, as a successful one you know within your institution or university we do encourage you to read other successful applications uh, see what those applicants included how they presented their information uh, ask colleagues and or your research grants uh, office for comments on your application. Uh, it's also good, as you know, we had briefly pointed out, to make your application accessible, you know, to a, to a wider public or wider expertise net. You know, ask both experts in your field and non-experts to review so that there's a general understanding, you know, like, yes, I can, uh, I can see where you're coming from for the application. Uh, plan ahead. Check institutional deadlines. Uh, NSERC does have their submission deadlines, but uh, within universities and other institutions, they have their internal deadlines. So just make sure uh, you're on top of those. And just a general, you know, to cover all of those, use, use any other resources available. Uh, it is a lot of time and effort to prepare an application, so making sure you present the best one possible, uh, obviously, is of your best interest. And it helps committee members, too, to see, uh, to see that kind of quality. I'll just check in with the institutional representatives here. Do you want to draw attention to your internal deadline? So for DGs, we're, we're always three weeks. Okay, three weeks before November yeah. 1st. Yeah, I mean, we do see some that float in after, but I really think planning ahead is important. I mean, yeah. this is, this is a, a program that you can really massage the application as you go through with yeah, more eyes on it. Yeah, for St. Mary's. Two weeks. Yeah. And, and I just um, wanted to point out that um, the had this problem before that the uh, researcher is not actually submitting to NSERC when they hit the button. They are right. only submitting to us, and uh, it is the institution that submits the application. Okay, so the okay. Institutional deadline is important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and in contrast to the NOI, which does not go through the institution, you are submitting your NOI directly to NSERC, but the application has to get approval, and boy, if you submit it. Eight hours before the deadline. <laughs> you, you, run, you run the risk of not having that application. Yeah. And Question back here. So you commented, you had a couple of slides about the review process, the mm -hmm. process. Um, I'm wondering if you have more about that in the presentation, because I had a couple of fairly specific questions about the decision making process and the feedback individuals get. Uh, that that's all we had within the slides themselves but do feel free if you have the questions I, I can do my okay. best to answer them I guess the one that um, kind of concerned me so I'm associate, <clears throat> associate Dean research so I try to kind of help shepherd all the applications forward and uh, we had an early career researcher who had a, a, a negative decision right she mm -hmm. just kind of missed the bar which you know fair enough but what um, was fairly disappointing about it was 
I'm just going to see if I have it here. Um, was the fact that she received no useful feedback from the panel. Um, so it's, it's kind of, uh, I'll just, the, so basically it, it fell over on the merit of the proposal, essentially. And the feedback from the committee was, the applicant did not make a compelling demonstration that the proposed work responds to the following points, originality and innovation, significance and expected contributions to research. So it's just a restatement of the criteria. And I just felt that for an early career researcher, it, the, the panel should take some level of responsibility to give useful feedback so that the individual can uh, provide. And, and you know, like they did have some, uh, obviously they had some peer reviews that were provided to them, but there's really no indication of what in the peer reviews might have, you know, led the panel to make its decision. So even, even something simple like, you know, uh, just copying and pasting from the peer reviews or something. Sure. So that was, you know, I felt that was kind of a, you know, in general the review process is really good. Uh -huh. uh, but in that case, I felt that it was not really fair to the to an early career researcher. Okay, there there may be some options available, but it'd probably be better to chat offline about it in terms of how to seek additional Input. feedback. Okay. Um, there may be more information available in this particular case. So, I mean, the committees the committees do prepare comments. The the uh, the what we require of the committees is that sorry, I'll just close the door. Is that um, is that if the rating is moderate or insufficient, they moderate must or below, yeah. provide they must a message. Provide a comment on the criterion. Um, and as you know, the comments go directly to the applicant who may choose to share those, but they don't have to, right, because it's confidential and personal information, uh, as well as the external review. So we do require a pro the preparation of a comment for those cases, um, and we do our best to kind of make sure that the important elements from the review come out in those. Sometimes they're not as informative yeah. as we might like. so. We can certainly chat about what other options may be available, keeping in mind that the committees uh, do most of the comment preparation in that week, that they're there when they're running between the rooms and they have 15 minutes. I mean, there are spaces in the day, but mm -hmm. we do our best and, and we can chat more with individual cases if, I, uh, if we need more information. I appreciate the time and yeah. pressure that people yeah. face during that week in Ottawa. Um, the other one had to do with um, generally the instructions to the committee and the peer reviewers, right? Because there's a peer review man manual and obviously the, the panel members go through, you know, fairly, I think, in detail kind of what they're supposed to look for and what they're not supposed to look for. Um, and just, you know, one specific example, but it applies generally. Um, I think there are specific instru instructions not to focus specifically on, like, the H index or, you know, right. yeah. Publishing in amazing venues with yes. wonderful impact factors. Yes. But you know we've seen a couple of examples where you know the only negative comment about a researcher from the, the reviewers was that their H index was not very high. Right. And this is for an individual who had like dozens of industry collaborations and mm -hmm. has paper awards and stuff. Um, and again, there was no feedback from the, the committee as to whether or not that was the decisive factor, right? And you know, I appreciate that the committee is not bound by the peer reviews, right? right. So there might have come, that there might have been something else that came up as a red flag, but again, there's no, you know, so I guess it's, it was just surprising given that, you know, the panel um, would have been aware of, of these criteria that the H index is not the be all and end all. Right, and, I, and we do, we are fairly, I mean, that, that picture that Phil showed with the, you know, the yep. program officer sitting at the table asking about the conflicts. That is, a, that is a very small part of what the program officers actually do in the meeting. And we do when, because it does sometimes happen, uh, somebody makes a comment or picks up on something from an external review referring to something like the H index. But frankly, we've seen lots of comments that come through in the peer reviews that are not useful for lots of reasons. Uh, but of course, there are lots of good reviews as well. Um, we, we don't keep a list of the things they disregard, but I can tell you that in the context of 
the types of activities we do with staff preparing for competition, the calibration exercises that we go through with the committees and all the pre-competition discussions, we say we don't look at these numerical factors. If it comes up, we will remind you not to. Yeah. Please disregard anything about this that comes up in the context of a review. <coughs> so we do reiterate that message consistently. And then, of course, you have applicants who include their H indices. In the and applications that, themselves, right, yeah. And that introduces a whole other you know, question that committees sort of struggle with. But we really do try to steer them away from using those kinds of factors, impact factors uh, and indices, and towards... More qualitative. Qualitative. Yeah. Has the applicant made the case that they have had, they have had good impact in mm -hmm. a certain area? And, and how have they done that? How have they demonstrated it in a really meaningful way in terms of reaching their target audience, influencing uh, yeah. the way that things are going in their discipline, that sort of thing. And disseminating in the appropriate fields as well, or the appropriate... Uh, yeah, and, and honestly, we can't... We can't... Uh, disown everything every peer reviewer says that is inappropriate and outside of the, the kinds of things we would normally ask them to talk about. So we do in our message to the applicant. So the message to applicant that the, the applicants receive includes a discussion of the indicators and there's also some text at the end from NSERC, uh, which I'm, I'm trying to get it kind of moved out and parked in a more clear way so that people can see that it's from NSERC where we talk about the external reviews a little bit more, just to say we're including these in your package because mm -hmm. they may have some useful information in them. You know, if there's anything in there that you find objectionable, it doesn't ne don't necessarily co take it to mean that the committee gave it full weight. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I would say that I think the discovery program process in looking at the big picture is better than almost any other funding pro uh, program in Canada. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate that. It's just in these cases where it's really difficult to connect the dots and say, if it wasn't just this numeric measure, what was it? Right? Yeah, and there's, right. there's nothing in the feedback to really right. support that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I guess I mixed up this, uh, the order of the slides, but just to speak quickly about delays, uh, how to present them in your application, how they're considered as well. Uh, so applicant delays are recorded in, in the CCV under the employment section, and I believe the CCV gives you the option to describe the delays a bit as well. Uh, any delays incurred by the HQP are recorded in the HQP section of the application, and you know a sentence or two to describe the uh, to describe the delay. Um, when you're describing them, we're really looking at you know clear start and end dates, so the duration, and then the focus really should be on how it impacted your research, uh, you know your ability to recruit HQP, um, dissemination of results, just the general progress of your research program. We're looking at how those delays impacted the research, and to clearly delineate you know why you know why it happened. Not necessarily you know you don't need to go into too much detail about the nature of the delay itself, just how it impacts the, the research, the period of research that uh, you're, you're in. Yeah, there are, I mean, there are different types of delays and some of them are very clear cut, right? If you have a, a parental leave, for example, and you were away on a full-time basis for a number of months, then that has a certain impact. But then there are other delays that are a little bit harder for the committee to more nuanced, on, and yeah. maybe you were working at a reduced workload because you needed some kind of uh, accommodation due to health or other issues, family issues, things like that. If you can describe the impact clearly, that is really the most important thing. Recognizing that whatever whatever the leave was that you took, whether it was a part-time leave or a full-time leave for a period of time, it was done under the auspices of your institution, right? And they're your employer, and they approve the leave, so it's not up to us to judge uh, the reason for the leave, so much as it is for us to look at the impact and consider whether it's something that should be accounted for in the merit review. Mm -hmm. uh, so then going back to the slide after the tips, uh, some available resources. Uh, you've got uh, DG Information Center, we've got several emails. You, uh, I believe online you have an access to every program officer uh, for each evaluation group. Uh, on uh, the NSERC website, there are resource videos. Uh, as we've described, the peer review manual 
uh, while it is a rather large document, it is very useful and we've spent a lot of time to make sure it's as comprehensive as possible with, uh, to describe the, the review process and what uh, reviewers are looking at. So that's an excellent resource. Uh, online there's also an HQP Frequently Asked Questions document. Uh, and then I believe we have the webinars, uh, or we, we're currently conducting webinars on how to apply both at the NOI stage and the full application stage that we encourage you, you know, if you're curious about uh, more information on that, we're hosting them. Uh, the dates are included online. I yeah. there's one on the state, that's all. That's all yeah. <laughs> I, I believe we've got one, yeah. yeah. They're posted <laughs> online. All right, so that was... Uh, application process for Discovery Grant uh, to just jump into the competition results for uh, the 2018 Discovery Grants competition. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to go into these results before first thanking uh, the enormous amount of work that goes into uh, providing these reviews, preparing, and uh, pulling through. So, you know, we've had over 400 uh, evaluation group members. Uh, assessing over 16,000 reviews, and we contact over 8,000 external reviewers uh, to provide reports to us to make sure you know we're giving each application the most fulsome review uh, that we can. So thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any reviewers in the room, but if not, then that thank you goes out maybe as a future reviewers to anyone here. <laughs> Uh, so just a general, an overall look at the uh, competition results for the Discovery Grants program. Um, I guess I should also note that we're not providing uh, award amounts in this uh, in this section because of the news from the budget. We don't have uh, any official numbers as as it were, uh, and in order to kind of lessen the, any confusion of putting out two different data sets, we're uh, keeping the awards and uh, uh, award amounts back for now. But you can see success rates for uh, both established researchers, early career researchers. Uh, we further break down established researchers into those returning uh, with a grant or those applying uh, without holding a grant uh, coming in. Uh, the bin distribution, as you can see, kind of uh, it peaks at bin J, which in terms of the merit uh, rating criteria is a strong, strong, strong. Um, ECRs are funded a bin lower into bin K, so you can see uh, you can kind of see that with the graph as well. I'll leave that up for a second if people wanted to. Yeah, so in terms of the success rate, I'll just comment. Typically, the funding cutoff for the established researchers is that peak at bin J. So anyone who's in bin J or higher will get funded. Uh, and, and normally for early career researchers, it's at K. Part of the reason for that is that NSERC has a rule that says we have to fund at least half of our early career hmm. researchers. And normally half is more than what you see in bin J. So we go down one additional bin. Yeah. You have the breakdown between small and large universities? The breakdown according to university size is normally released in our uh, package. statistics package, which usually we publish in June. Uh, but on. for the reasons stated by Phil, we're still not sure what's happening with the mm -hmm. 2018 budget money we're going to publish a single set of results only once those decisions are made. But if you look at previous year's packages, which you may have already done, it shows the historical trends. And we will be releasing similar information again this year. Likely yeah. likely towards the fall. We expect it in the fall. We expect it in the fall. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. Uh, and so just as I had uh, briefly mentioned earlier, you know, NSERC is really pushing uh, to include more information about equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, so we've broken down the uh, success rates, number of awards and success rates by both the applicant category, uh, ECR and established researcher, and then uh, break it down farther into uh, female, male, not indicated. Uh, one thing to note is that, so the, the asterisk down there is it's data from the CV. Uh, we do recognize that we're not asking uh, necessarily the right questions at this point, and we are working to include more gender inclusive language, um, but we can report on what we've received so far, uh, which is, you know, sex is aggregated data. And, um, you know, just uh, to note as well that, you know, the not indicated doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they are more towards a female or male, it's just that the applicants uh, had chosen not to indicate. Yeah, and just one other thing for net, for the, the coming competition is that we are going to continue to use these fields from the CCB for now. Uh, but alongside that, we are trying to develop the more gender inclusive 
uh, language that will be incorporated into the research portal because we have control over that, whereas uh -huh. the CCB we have very little control over. Yeah. So what you'll notice this year is that applicants will actually have to do both because we have to decide now whether we're going to hold on to the CCB fields or not. And in the event that our plans for the portal don't materialize in time for the deadline, we're going to keep them both in the, in the process for now until we're sure that the, the research portal information that we're going to try to collect that's more inclusive is actually going to be in place in time for the deadline. Yeah. So we're kind of caught in, in between the releases with the, with the research portal, but that's our best solution right now. Yeah. So please bear with us while we, while we make the transition into the portal to collect this more, more helpful, I think, data. And uh, another thing to note for this year is that the field in the CCB will be a mandatory field uh, for applicants to fill out, but they will have the option of selecting either male, female, or uh, you know, not uh, prefer not to answer. Um, the data is only uh, collected for statistical purposes, and it is not presented to the reviewers, so it's not uh, it's not part of the application package. So there, that data is just for collection. Yeah. I'm curious if the, these data are available. Uh, we we do have that <laughs> we do have that information. If you if you have specific not uh, we don't have it in the slide deck today, but uh, if you have specific questions, I'm sure we can uh, we can provide that by evaluation group. Yeah. yeah. Uh, moving forward, just the general uh, from year to year, the uh, competition results for the uh, research tools and instruments uh, program. So RTI's grant and foster grant foster and enhance the discovery, innovation, training capability of university researchers uh, by supporting the purchase and use of uh, research equipment. Um, so as you can see, the uh, you know uh, the number of applications to the 2018 competition are over a thousand. Uh, in part due to the fact that we removed the quota from universities, uh, uh, so there is no quota for them uh, to apply. Uh, using about the same amount of money that we've had uh, in previous years. Uh, you can see uh, success rate and funding rate uh, for 2018 lies at about 20 to 21 percent. Yeah, just to distinguish those success rate means the percentage of applications that were funded. The applications can range in value from $7,000 to $150,000. The funding rate refers to the percentage of dollars requested. Versus the dollars funded. received, yeah. Uh, for some mysterious reason those numbers are always very close together when you consider the range of requests. I'm not sure what the explanation is for that. Maybe it's just some strange coincidence. I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> the uh, success rate really collapsed in 2018. It's because the, yeah, the, the number success rate went down significantly this year and that's because we lifted the quotas. So we removed the institutional quotas, which had been in place previously, uh, and recognizing that we'd likely get an increase in applications. As a result of that, we, we added one rule back in, which was to say you could only be a co-applicant or an applicant on, on one, one application. application. So that was, that was how we tried to contain the, the explosion just a little bit. And, and the but obviously, went, it's still The budget like went down to nearly 2015 levels, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and part of well, so the source of the research tools and instruments budget typically is our year-end funds because we can spend RTI money all at once and it doesn't imply any future commitments. We kind of use it as a clearinghouse for whatever money may be left over from other programs that haven't been spent. But this year we did, we did commit to a $25 million level of funding in the hope that there might be a possibility of it going up, but there were no additional funds that could be added into that pot at the end of the year. Sometimes it happens, so we're always sort of crossing our fingers that our colleagues and other programs don't spend all their money, but yeah. they seem to have figured us out. Okay. And over to me. That is all for me. <laughs> All right, so with some discovery updates. So these are, um, here, just a second. These are updates related to the discovery programs. And by discovery programs, we're referring to discovery grants, research tools and instruments, and a handful of additional programs, such as the Northern Supplements and Shift Time, which uh, reside in my team because I'm the, I'm the team leader for the environmental sciences uh, disciplines, the evolution and ecology and geosciences groups. Uh, 
as well as Discovery Accelerator supplements, Discovery Development Grants, and a handful of other programs. So just a few updates for you and reminders. This one, we're trying to make sure that we get good understanding of in the, in the community and in the grantees who are out there because it, I, these policies have been in place for a long time. Often when we come out to meetings like this and remind people, they'll say, wow, I never knew that I could do that. So here we are. <laughs> so if an, uh, we have had in place for many years a policy that says if you take a parental leave um, as a grantee, you're eligible for some additional funding, potentially contact NSERC and we can talk about whether you can get an extra year of extension to your grant, which includes funds. Uh, more recently, we've introduced this pilot which says if you qualify for a parental and maternity leave, even if you choose not to take it, because we were hearing that lots of grantees were choosing not to take their leave, you may still be eligible for an extension with funds. So please keep that in mind. Uh, we work with the institutions to sort of get the confirmation that the, that the grantee has qualified. And if we get that confirmation, then we'll consider you eligible for an extension under this first policy. Similar policy in place for family and medical leave. So if you have family members you need to take time off of work to care for, or if you have a medical situation which requires you to take time off work, you may be eligible for additional funds up to two years, depending on your circumstances. So contact your research office. We will work with them. Our finance people will work with them to see if you are eligible for additional funds. The trick with discovery grants is sometimes you will have some some problem, some need for leave right around the deadline time and it's not like you can apply any time, we're on an annual cycle. So we take that into account when we make the decisions about these extensions. Um, so depending on your circumstances, please make sure that you, you reach out and contact us if you think you might be eligible for this. Um, and this can be done sort of retroactively within the period of your grant. So if this happened to you or one of your colleagues and, it and they're on a grant and they're due for renewal, but it happened a couple of years ago, we can still consider the extension. And so we've added a reminder into the email that we send to all of our potential applicants to make sure that they're, they're aware of this. But uh, this is just to sort of increase understanding. This was mentioned in our contact newsletter recently as well. Uh, and also, if as a grantee you have students or fellows who take parental or maternity leave, you may be able to apply for additional funds to pay for their stipend while they're on leave up to six months. Uh, and what that would do, of course, is it would free up your grant fund again to hire a replacement or something like that to fill the gap while they're on leave. And that's paid by NSERC and that's a posted post-award administration uh, policy as well. Okay, so a bit of information about early career researchers. We've heard about early stage researchers and early career researchers for the purpose of the Discovery Grants program. We have a very specific definition of ECRs. Uh, for many years it was a two-year window and it's been expanded to a three-year window. So anyone who has three years or less of independent academic experience that would normally make them eligible to apply for a Discovery Grant is considered to be an early career researcher. In the simplest example that means if you're in your position that you were, you've been in from the beginning since July 2015, that's, that's the three-year window. But we do have ways of accounting for if, you've, you know, if you were in a position and you took a leave and you were in another position, we kind of do the math to cumulatively figure out how, if, you were, if you're at the three-year mark or below the three-year mark to qualify as an early career researcher. Uh, you do now, as of last year, have an opportunity in the application to indicate if you think you are an early career researcher and to explain why you think that's the case. Uh, it's important for you to address the question of whether you were required to do independent research as part of your previous experience and whether you were permitted to supervise students because those are kind of the two key pieces of the question when we're looking at whether your years of experience count towards the three years or not. Um, also, if you are an early career researcher on your first grant, I, I should say if at the time that you received your, your current grant you were an early career researcher, you will be or have been offered an additional year of funds, a sixth year of funds to extend that grant. The idea being that as described by Phil earlier, you know, when we look at that merit rating scale and the six point scale and the three criteria, all applicants are measured 
in the same way. And so for our early career researchers who are coming back for their first renewal to end up in the same pool as everybody else, we wanted to give them that extra year so you have an opportunity to extend your grant. Um, so this is something, how, I don't know how long we've been doing this. I think it's this three or the, four years. This is the second year oh, that second. I've seen. Yeah. Okay, it hasn't been too long since we started doing this in any case. So um, people who were to be offered this extension will have received the reminder that they're due to renew, and then after that they would have received a notice saying that they were eligible to get the extension. So please make sure you follow up with staff if you've been offered one of those. Uh, this is an example of the equity, diversity, and inclusion information that we collect in the CCV, and this is coming back to Phil's point, which is that uh, unlike sort of the old days of discovery grant applications, now that we have the CCV and the other online modules, when you fill up a module in the screen, what the peer reviewers see does not look exactly like it looked when you filled it out. So there is information that's contained in the modules which is not included in the application package that goes to reviewers. That includes your sex information. There's other information too, administrative information that we use for administrative purposes that doesn't go to the peer reviewers. So other examples would be if you had an environmental assessment that you had to do if you check the box on EA or if you check the box on stem cells or something like that. That kind of information doesn't normally get conveyed over to the committee because we use it for internal purposes. The same goes for this information. Uh, and as mentioned, it is mandatory. Uh, now to include that information, but not not indicated as a choice. Yeah, right? or fill prefer in the draw. Prefer not, not to answer. answer. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so this was kind of already covered in what Phil was presenting about the highly qualified personnel literature change. So for those of you who are coming back after having um, received a grant more than two years ago, you will notice that the instructions are new in terms of the HQP and similar for the relationship to other sources of support. There is some new information, much along the lines of what you saw in the previous slide in that earlier section. RTI, so we have made a few changes to the RTI selection criteria this year, uh, taking the five that we had before and consolidating them into three. Essentially what we've done is uh, paired up some of the criteria, and I didn't actually yeah. print out what they were. Do you so, have them handy, Phil? So it, it, previously the criteria were essentially split 2020, 2020 among the, or 2020, 2020 among the five. Yeah. Um, the weighting now will be 40, 40, 20. Uh, with each of the 40, there's the need, urgency, suitability of equipment for the program, uh, the merit of research programs supported by the equipment and the excellence of the applicant and then 20% for importance of equipment for training of HQP. Okay, so it really encompasses the same elements, but we have consolidated some of the criteria and weighted them accordingly. What's, uh, what the other thing you'll notice this year if you do submit an application to the RTI program is that we are going to give some scoring feedback to the applicants. We'll tell them what their ratings were in the different criteria, which we have not given that kind of feedback before. So the idea is that by giving it, we'll be able to at least show where you could strengthen the application. Because of the scale of the RTI competition and the time frame we do it in, there's no real opportunity to give other feedback beyond that, but we're hoping that the ratings at least will give will help, yeah. a little bit of information to people when you didn't have anything like that before. Uh, okay, discovery accelerator supplements. I mentioned this as one of the sort of elements of the discovery suite of programs. These are uh, supplements to the discovery grant, which you do not have to apply for. Your application for a DAS is implicit when you submit a discovery grant proposal, and we give 125 of these every year to applicants who meet this sort of description. Um, and it is $120,000 typically profiled over three years, the first three years of the discovery grant. Uh, they're, they're allocated to the evaluation groups on a quota basis. And as part of the review process, the, the members who are reading the applications will nominate certain applications for the DAS, and that gets discussed during competition in that 15 minutes that I mentioned earlier. And then at the end of the competition, 
what we call the executive committee of the EG, which is the co-chairs and the group chair, uh, will sit down and rank the nominees to make their selections. Yeah. And the, the members, uh, after nominating the application for DAS, will, be, uh, will provide a rationale. Uh, after the discussion takes place during the review period, they'll provide a rationale as to why that application uh, you know, should be nominated for the DAS. So, um, so the DAS is interesting. How do I go back? Um, yes, that's right. Oh, it's, it's backwards. It's the right one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not the top-ranked applications that get the DAS. Correct. Not necessarily. Not that's necessarily, right. yeah. yeah. So you could fall into bin H and get a DAS. Yes. Okay. So what, <clears throat> what's the divergence of criteria there to get a DAS relative to, you know, excellence of the researcher and so on and so forth? Right, so it has a lot to do with sort of whether they've achieved an international level of leadership or caliber in their discipline. And so if a person is already at that sort of international influence level, they're probably going to be in the top bins and they would not qualify for the DAS because they they don't show, show strong potential to become, they already are international leaders. Okay. So that's kind of that's kind of where the space is between those top ranked applications and the DAS recipients. And in terms of the merit, like the exceptional to insufficient, obviously it should be a fungible application. There aren't any um, any cutoffs in terms of the merit rating for a DAS nomination, but uh, it kind of comes part and parcel that the applicants being nominated for DAS, they will typically be Strong, strong researcher with a strong program with the potential to, uh, you know, boost them to an international stature. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So it could be like one of the evaluation criteria is <clears throat> amazing, and the other two are could strong, be an basically. absolutely amazing proposal, right, from someone who hasn't quite achieved that international level of influence yet. Okay. Yeah, but the committee just gets really excited. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know if there's anybody here who's interested in the Northern Research Supplements, but I'm prepared to talk about it if you're interested. These are offered to researchers who um, work in the north, north of the semi-discontinuous permafrost, semi anyway, in the north. And there is a, there's an NRCAN map which is available on the NRS uh, web page to kind of show you where that is exactly. Uh, but these are supplements to the DG. They do require a separate application, although in the past they have required a Form 100 and 101, which was extremely cumbersome for our applicants who were coming through the portal. And I'm very happy to say that we're working hard to make sure that they can actually apply through the portal this year as an extra checkbox and a couple of extra attachments that will be incorporated into the discovery grant application so it won't require all of that extra CV and other uh, pieces. So ten to twenty-five thousand dollars a year is the typical supplement mostly for logistical costs of working in the north but also for outreach activities taking place in the north. And similarly ship time is a pretty specialized program. It's for researchers who need to charter time on research vessels to go out and do their research. Uh, we have a $1 million a year budget. The deadline is September 1st. That's a Saturday, so the deadline is actually September 4th this year. Um, and usually the turnaround is quite quick. We, we announced those results in late November, and it has a lot to do with the scheduling of ship time for vessels that belong to the Canadian Coast Guard because we have an agreement with them that kind of requires us to have that information ready. So if you'd like more information about either of those, I'm happy to chat more afterwards. And we have a, a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Natural of, of National Defense, excuse me, uh, because they had some money to spend on research and they didn't have a means to flow the money. And we signed this MOU and there is now a mechanism for them to allocate funds to our discovery grant recipients who are working in target areas that they've identified as a priority. So this is D&D &D money. Uh, in order to apply for it, applicants need to check a box on the research portal at the time that they submit the discovery grant application and complete one additional free form module describing how their research is eligible for this uh, supplement. And what happens in terms of processes once all of our decisions are made in terms of funding discovery grants, we will take those ones where people have indicated an interest 
we will forward them on to D&D and they have their own internal selection process for deciding who is going to get those 20 supplements valued at a total of $120,000. Um, where we would have expected sort of those applicants to fall within very specific evaluation groups, I've actually been kind of surprised by the range of uh, researchers that have indicated that they're eligible for this, so it's definitely worth having a look at uh, if you think you're interested and maybe that your research would be of interest to D&D. So I have a few corporate updates now. Um, there was a question about the investment in research and what's happening with that money. I think that was from one of the online participants. So there was substantial federal investment in the tri-agencies this year in response to the NALA report that was received that was uh, released last April. Uh, this money to NSERC, $350 million, is sort of the, the final value after five years when we receive money from the government. They sort of infuse it as an initial amount and then they have to ramp it up over time to make sure that it's distributed across for example, competition years for discovery grants. If we award, if we awarded all three hundred fifty thousand in year one, we'd be making commitments, and nobody else would get any. So we add about ninety million dollars a year over uh, over a period of years. We are currently in the process of negotiating with uh, with the government how we're going to spend that money exactly, and that takes some time. So uh, it was a little bit of a it was a little bit confusing when the federal budget got announced and it happened right near when the discovery grant results for this year's competition were announced because we were not able to incorporate those numbers into the current grants. But we're working on it and we will be releasing that information as soon as it's available. We're expecting something in the fall, hopefully, and that's around the time that you'll see the stats come out as well. Thank you very much. Yes? I just have a clarification. Sure. And expect people who were successful last year to get more money? Uh, in the competition that just passed? Yes. We expect that that's going to be part of the implementation, yes. We don't Thank have you. the full picture yet, but uh, when the notices to the decision went out this year for the competition that just ended, they had certain dollars associated with them because we had to figure out what we were going to do with this year's, with the current money. And then we shortly afterwards sent a note out saying, yes, we understand that the new money has come in, but we haven't quite figured it out, and we'll let you know as soon as we do. As I said, just clarification. Yeah, thank yeah, thank you. So this shows, this is, this is not including any new money. This shows the, the change in the Discovery Grants budget over time. So the little black box that you see sitting on top is that DAS money, so the 125 DAS awards each year. That has remained constant over the years, and the white bar is the actual allocation to the Discovery Grants program. So it has been increasing. It did get a little bit flatter this year, and we expect that to change. Of course, the average grant has not changed, and that's due mainly to an increase in the number of applicants that we're seeing. A couple of other corporate updates, open access. This is not really new, but it is for anybody who has a grant that was has a start date of May 1st, 2015 or sooner. So our open access policy has now been in place for three years and it requires applicants to uh, make their publications available in open access venues within a certain time frame. So the details of the policy can be accessed through the links. Um, did you, for, oh, we can make these slides available to this group? Yeah, or? yeah, I can provide the slides. Okay, yeah. so the links are all in there. Certainly the frequently asked questions in the toolbox can be very useful tools. Uh, this is a tri-agency policy, so it's something that CIHR and SHRC are also on board with. We have, we have heard lots of questions over the years about this policy. The Canadian Association of Research Librarians has been very supportive in their, in, in how they manage the policy too, because it does present a real challenge to a lot of researchers, and we recognize that. Yeah. I, I can read the documents if I need to, but I thought yeah. it was worth asking for everybody. Some of my publications are in journals that don't allow me to put the document in a repository. I have to get 
an author's draft copy, and that I'm allowed to put in, but not the not the one that appeared in the journal. Right. And I can't afford twelve thousand dollars to make an article open source, uh, sorry, openly available from the journal. What am I supposed to do going forward? Am so, I supposed to say I will not publish in these journals? So the question is about what to do when a when a venue you're publishing in doesn't permit uh, putting it in an open access place. And so my question back is, does that include your institu an institutional repository, yes. for instance? Yes, because I've been trying to put things, in, I've been putting everything I can into my institutional repository. Uh -huh. And some things come back and they say, sorry, the publisher does not allow us to include it if you have your, a draft that you wrote yourself before review, we can accept it. Okay. But we can't accept what they actually published. And the publisher says, we can make it open access if you give us, for example, right. some of them $12,000. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know that was in the past, but uh -huh. going forward, I mean, I, I can, we can all read the document, but if you know, I think it would help all of us to, to hear now together. Yeah. I, I don't know how to deal with that specific question. I, I maybe somebody else does. I thought the preprint submission was satisfactory. I think it might be. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think it's the it penultimate is, yeah. draft. Thank you. Yeah, just, just I know from from my field uh, in particle physics, they we always submit uh, open access preprints at the time of submission to the journals, right. and the journals we go to are similar to what he's saying. But I think we've checked it that it complies with tri agency policy to have a repository of preprints. Okay. Thank you. So data management, this is something that we were sort of sort of followed on after the open access policy because it was another one of these topics that we were talking about with the other agencies. We did release a statement of principles which did not set out any mandatory requirements in uh, 2016 and hot off the presses just since last week. We have now released the draft policy which we've been talking about doing for several months now and it is available online and we are inviting individuals and groups any interested parties to have a look at that policy and send us your comments. I believe that the consultation is open until the end of August. So please do have a look at it. This is, um, this is one of those things that if you, give, if you give your attention to it now, hopefully you can have your, your comments taken into account before the policy is finalized because I know that this is very challenging for a lot of people and I've also heard based on our interactions with uh, researchers who have a lot of international collaborations that other countries, for example, uh, countries in the EU have already set out some mandatory data management policy requirements and things of that type. So I think that we're trying to kind of emulate some of that stuff, but you may have some experience with this type of policy that would help inform ours. So please have a look at that. EDI, so we released our new, new EDI framework. Uh, in the last year and we have an EDI website. This is useful for applicants if you're trying to figure out what it is we actually want you to talk about when you talk about EDI yeah. in your application. Yeah. It can be useful for reviewers because we have some modules in there about bias and peer review and equity, diversity and inclusion. There are lots of links in there that can be very useful and so you can see following the breadcrumb in that, uh, in that screenshot at the bottom of the slide that's where you can find that information and there are some useful resources and we're working with the other agencies to try to coordinate our efforts in this area as well. And we're closing in on uh, the end of our deck I think aren't we still? So a couple of slides just on your upcoming deadline so please remember your DG NOI is due on August 1st. Again you don't have to go through your institution for this but do try to do your summary in as clear a way that's as well in line with what you're planning to actually do as possible because that is used to help inform the selection of external reviewers and of course if you change what you submit in your application from what you said you were going to do in your NOI we might be a little bit off the mark in terms of the external so please keep that in mind. If you are a subatomic physicist, a physicist applying to that committee and you have a major resources support or category two or three RTI application 
there's an NOI deadline also at the same time. Two and three, I think, is $150,000 and up. And upcoming application deadlines. These are the full applications. The awards for science promotion. So this is a little bit aside from the discovery stuff. Normally, the deadline is in September, but it hasn't quite been decided when it's going to be this year. So stay tuned to keep an eye on our website if you're interested in that one. The ship time program, September 4th, as I said. Uh, and these other deadlines are coming up through September and October. And I think that's my last slide. So I would invite any questions, comments, advice, so suggestions. Maybe, so the uh, uh, question from uh, well, uh, so, so in, in the UK, um, because where, where it was before, for um, uh, well, just about, of course, answer, of course, wants to get maximum research out of their dollar that they spend. Yes. Yeah. Of course, in the UK, for medical research, you don't have to pay sales tax. So I never understand why, of course, answer is not for medical research. It's still, okay. it's government money going to research. Uh -huh. But uh, quite a chunk of that goes to HST, which then goes back to government. Maybe a different branch of government, but it's from government circling around to government. Um, that seems to be a bit inefficient to me. Uh, would, wouldn't it be better that all the money res that, that we would be are exempt of HST? We can spend more money on, on, on research. Do you have a comment on that? I, I have no I'm not sure. Maybe it's still the cloud cuckoo land here. No, that's it. Okay. But, but still, the, 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 the chunk of. of, of 4.95. No, well, well, I see the, the amount of HST is much higher. That cannot be that, that low. You don't end up paying it out of your grant, though. You only end up paying provincial sales tax out of your grant, out of the insert grant. It gets refunded. It gets it's refunded. refunded. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I haven't, I haven't seen that question before. Because I think it would vary from province yeah. to province, financial right? Yeah, but in yeah. Nova Scotia, it's only 4.9%. Yeah. Okay. The financial services. That's why your books look funny. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? Anyone might I think uh, we have a few minutes left, so we can sort of we can we can close up. And if people have questions that you'd like to ask, sort of one on one, I'm okay to stay a little bit yeah, longer. Yeah, Phil, are you too? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Hope that was useful. And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.